Welcome back to the Ed Morrissey Show podcast. I can't tell you what a delight this episode is going to be. My old friend Bill Whittle is back joining us here. He's got a new project with Daily Wire Plus. It's called What We Saw, An Empire of Terror. And I've just I've just had a chance to watch the first episode. This thing is fantastic. Uh, it's it, I'm not even going to talk about it. Bill, I'm going to let you set up what we saw an empire of terror, because I'm telling you, this takes me back <laughs> well, takes me way back. Well, here's the thing, Ed, you know, the, the, I think the thing that motivated me to do this, this uh, fourth series for Daily Wire was the fact that um, you can go to American college campuses and see people with, you know, T-shirts of Che or Lenin or or people are not afraid to you know, walk around with the hammer and sickle logo. Huh. And and not like anybody's keeping score on this, you know, uh, scoreboard from hell. But the communists killed, you know, many times more people than the Nazis did. And my my initial uh, idea for this project was why is it that that we're correctly enough enjoined to never forget the Holocaust, but, but never remember the 100 million people that were killed by communism. So I just decided that I was going to originally decided I was going to do something on the terror masters of the Soviet Union, the leaders of the Secret Service. But as I started doing the research and, and started doing some of the writing, it's like all roads led back to the same place. And I thought they were going to lead back to Stalin, but they didn't. They all came back to Lenin, every single one of them. And and so it became pretty clear to me early that there's in Russia alone, 20 million people who have been who've been killed by their own government and no one is speaking for them. And I took my responsibility to them very seriously. And so from the outset, I realized that this can't just be oh, some conservative guy criticizing communism. If I was going to make this case stick and I consider it a legal case, then that meant that I was going to have to use evidence that was in their own words, their own records, their own data, their own photographs, that none of this was going to be opinion, that none of this was going to be um, uh, hy- just suppositions or, or hypotheses. I was, and, and, I, and anytime I had a set of numbers I, that I was available to me, I would always go with the lowest set of numbers. Because you and I know how this business works. You spell one thing wrong on a lower third and people go, oh, well, I can't even get that right. What does he know about the rest of this, you know, this whole thing? So I had this fanatical devotion to, um, to, to being within the bounds of provable truth. And there's so much factual, provable data on who these communists were and what they did that I could have done 30 episodes and not broken a sweat, I don't think. So, I mean, I've seen the, first episode i think you're up to three now mm-hmm. is that three right? out of eight yeah three out of eight so it's gonna be an eight episode um each episode um without commercials it runs about Cor- what 20 minutes correct yeah it's a little under an hour and this is the beauty of course of working with with somebody like daily wire not only do they have the uh the production facilities the thing is i just think it's gorgeous i had a number of people for those of you who haven't seen it yet uh, the first six episodes take place with me delivering it in the basement of the Lubyanka. And then the final two take place with me delivering it um, on a on a side of a bluff overlooking a gulag. And I had a number of people ask me, how on earth did you get permission to get into the Lubyanka in order to shoot this thing? Well, it, it's a practical set, but we have one of those uh, high definition LED walls behind the set. So all of the corridors and stuff are computer generated, but you wouldn't know it. It looks like I'm actually right there in those environments. I didn't know it. I well, did not know that. I mean, it, that's the level of production that the Daily Wire went to for this. It, it looks like I'm there. And as I say in the introduction, um, we're not going to bring these stories to you uh, because they they won't fit in your living room. Uh, we're going to take you to them. We're going to we're going to bring you to them. The first episode is different than the other uh, seven. Uh, first episode is called uh, well, first is called Innocent People. The first chapter is called A Modern City. We spent about a half an hour going around Moscow, modern day Moscow, Moscow today, and showing, oh, in this building, 36,000 people were shot in the back of the head. Just behind this little gate in this courtyard, 14,000 people were murdered. Here's a field that looks like any other field you might see in an American city, 65,000 bodies buried beneath this field. And my my objective with the first episode was to punch people in the guts hard enough for them to realize that, no, this is a crime scene. And it, it is, in fact, the largest crime scene on the face of the planet. And from there, we just basically start telling the story of the Russian Revolution because it's all baked into what communism and Bolshevism is. Yes. One of the things that I learned about this, it, and I think anybody who watches the, the series comes away without much doubt about this, 
the people who defend the system say, well, they didn't do it right. Or maybe Lenin created this paradise and Stalin came in and, and, and turned it into a nightmare. But as I say in the show, Ed, uh, they didn't do this the wrong way and they didn't do it the right way. They did it the only way. It's the only way to do it. Right. In order to coerce people to work harder for the state than they do for themselves, you have to have a very large stick. And that stick is terror. And that's why this entire empire was predicated on everybody being afraid all the time. And it's interesting, too, because in what, late 1930s, um, Friedrich Hayek wrote a definitive, um, I think, analysis. He's an economist, but he wrote a definitive analysis of why these systems, even though they're well-intentioned, inevitably produce monsters, because monsters is the only way that you can force this system to continue operating past its uh, past the you know when, whenever its internal contradictions come to fore internal economic con contradictions is, that was Hayek's premise in the road to serfdom and it I mean you can take the road to serfdom which he based on the <laughs> example of Lenin and Stalin yep. and Trotsky I want to talk a little bit about Trotsky too because you mentioned yeah, Trotsky. Me too. I, I think you I think you make some really great points about Trotsky but um but you can I mean you can take a look at Venezuela and see exactly the same arc it's the same arc every single time the only time that that arc gets interrupted is when the people are still able to throw off the socialist marxist system like for instance in the scandinavian countries i think uh, sweden in particular um once they realize that the once they realize the internal contradictions and the internal contradictions uh can no longer be uh masked uh they move away from them and um you never got that they never got that choice in mexico in mexico at least not for a long time but certainly in russia i meant to say russia but mexico is another example of this they had the, a bolshevik re revolution about the same time that russia did and um in uh, and ironically of course trotsky was murdered in mexico because yes he was there because they had the same type of communist uh you know roughly communist system uh that um russia was trying to put together there uh but you're right and i, I mean in the the first episode at least is extremely clear on this the terror began at the very beginning in fact it began before the beginning it began in did. five when trotsky formed the red army uh well trotsky formed the red army after the revolution but in 1905 there was the aborted uh, 1905 revolution oh, which sorry, was yeah. a result which was as a result of bloody sunday where the where the peasants basically a, a large number of, of highly devout peasants made a march on the winter palace in in uh saint petersburg and basically they just they were they they were holding up pictures of the czar and they referred to the czar as the little father because the big father's up in heaven and they were singing hymns in praise of the czar and then one of the um, members of the Imperial Guard, because because Nicholas wasn't even in the Imperial Palace, orders the troops to, to basically open fire on these civilians and a thousand people are killed. This is 1905. Trotsky comes to center stage then, tries to get this revolution up and going, doesn't work, and they have to wait until 1917. But what you said about, about the examples of international socialism are, are, are so obvious. Venezuela is a great example. Back in the day when we were all doing the same blogosphere kind of thing and mostly doing, you know, uh, written posts, um, when Venezuela first started to go to a leftist government, I saw something that I never forgot it. And, and that's um, if you want to see what what socialism really is, there's a photo that came out of Venezuela of a tiger that hadn't been fed in the in the local zoo in Venezuela. And if you've ever seen a starving tiger, you don't want to see a starving tiger. I, I, I mean, a skin and bones tiger is is tragic on a level that that hits you just viscerally. And this is the result of this economic system. And Argentina shows us, by the way, that if you go the other way, then, you know, hooray, happy days. But I'm not even going to make the argument about economics because it's bigger than that. This is a mass murder that occurred. And, yes. and not only has it not been documented, it has been suppressed. It's been suppressed because the people who control what we see and what we hear have collectivist leanings. They like the idea of being able to tell other people what to do. And it's embarrassing for them to have the one state where everybody was told what to do, have the light of day sh shown upon it. But nevertheless, there it is. And the only thing that really compares to, to Soviet and communist cruelty is Soviet and communist incompetence. Uh, episode three, which was just released, is called the Ramshackle Revolution. And 
if it weren't such a tragedy, it'd be fully hilarious. I mean, the Russian Revolution itself was was romanticized by Sergei Eisenstein in his in his um, in his movie October, which was commissioned by the Bolsheviks ten years after the after the event. But during the actual revolution, the mayor of of uh, Petrograd at the time it was called said um, sent messengers out to both camps saying, "Has the revolution started yet? We just we just want to make sure that we that we're keeping our people indoors." Most people slept through it, and and to give you an idea of the level of incompetence of this government and how and how ad hoc the whole thing was. The, in in the ramshackle revolution, you discovered that the that the the beginning of the Great Russian Revolution was going to be when the sailors on the Kronstadt Fortress, I'm sorry, the Peter Paul's Fortress, just across from uh, the Winter Palace, were to hoist a red lantern up to the top of of, of one of these uh, pinnacles. So they're ready to begin the revolution, and everybody's all armed and set to go. And uh, and they realize nobody remembered to bring a red lantern. So uh, so so the guy who's in charge of the garrison goes stumbling around, falls through the mud, comes completely splattered in mud, gets over to the mainland, spends about two hours trying to find a red lantern, can't find one, does find a purple lantern, however, brings that back to the fortress. They're about to run that up the flagpole, but there's nowhere to attach the lantern, which is probably good because otherwise we'd be talking about the, the glorious purple October revolution, you know? I mean, this is the, this is the level of of incompetence and and not just incompetence, but improvisation. Anybody, anybody other than Kerensky would have suppressed this rebellion with a great deal of 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 ease. And and of all the things that were written about Lenin, I think the truest one is that Lenin was very very lucky in his enemies. That everybody who opposed Lenin was on some level either blinded to him or incompetent or incapable of acting against him. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, unfortunately, providential, I, I would say, or maybe, maybe demonic is a little bit uh, more. Of a no, point. no, that's a pretty good word, man. That's about, <laughs> it's, he's about as close as you get here on, on planet earth. And, and you know, and here's the thing that, that is the most striking thing about the, about the Bolsheviks and the communist revolution is how theoretical the whole thing is, how divorced from reality. Lenin had not been in Russia for 17 years prior to his return through on the sealed train to Germany to start the revolution. 17 years. He's sitting in cafes in Zurich and in, and in uh, London and in Paris, and he's talking about revolution. And he's sitting there with guys like Trotsky, and they're having 15-hour discussions about whether you're a Zenoviate or whether you're a Bakaranite or whether or not you're more of a this or more of a that. And, and everything is theory. People don't enter into this equation at all. There is no connection to reality at all. Economics don't enter into this reality at all. It is a train set that's built by people who go down every day and spend six hours painting the little pencil thin mustache on the tiny little conductor and everything's all planned out and everything's gonna work exactly right. And all you have to do is plug it in and get some electricity and off it goes. But, but the theoretical aspect of this is to me the reason why why you can't put intellectuals in charge of things because intellectuals are the only people who are stupid enough to believe that they're smarter than a hundred million other people. And, and, and that is, that is a profoundly stupid thing to believe in. And that's, I mean, again, to go right back to Hayek. That's what Hayek's argument was, is that a hundred people sitting in a capital can't possibly manage the, the economics of a hundred million people whose interests they already know better. Um, Correct, and that's the that's the that's the fatal contradiction in, in communism and socialism and arrogance. It's just arrogance and hubris, and we see this, by the way, just just a moment off topic here. But we see this by the by the way today with many scientists who assume that because they have an extraordinarily deep knowledge of one particular subject, that this knowledge applies to every subject. A lot of people will use Albert Einstein as Albert Einstein once said, uh, you know, this idea of preparing for war is foolish, and it's. Why the hell are you asking Albert Einstein about this? You don't go to Albert Einstein for grooming tips. I mean, Albert Einstein knew nothing about politics. He was a he's a theoretical physicist. He's a genius, but he knows nothing about people. He once knocked on his own door and asked if the professor was home. This is how this is how far away from humanity Albert Einstein was. And that's the thing about guys like Lenin, Trotsky, and Stalin, Ed, is how not just inhuman they are, but Lenin especially anti-human, the, the hatred that he had for peasants, the hatred that he had for his own people, really. It was all about his personal power. And he had to invert communism in order to bring it to Russia, which is what episode two is all about, basically. 
Well, I haven't gotten to episode two, but I want to talk a little bit about Trotsky in episode sure. one. Um, and you'll hear this from time to time. Um, Trotsky gets lionized because Stalin was just so bad that it was impossible to overlook how awful Stalin was. Um, so Trotsky's made out to be some sort of, well, if only if, Tro if only Trotsky had sure. prevailed over Stalin, then the, it would have worked perfectly. Trotsky <laughs> was at least as bad, if not worse. And the, the machinery of, you know, the Lubyanka and the uh, Lefortevo and all that, that kind of springs from Trotsky's end of the triumvirate here. The, the, um, the brutal um, terrorism that it was required to put this into place. Trotsky was not much different than Lenin or Stalin in that sense. It's just yeah. that they got crosswise with each other, not because there was a huge philosophical difference between them. Like I said uh, at the very beginning, um, the most important aspect of this for me was to make sure I did all this in their own words. So I must have 25 or 30 quotes, at least, at least that in the course of the series, where Trotsky is essentially saying, no, just kill them all. No, the solution is just kill them. No, just shoot them. No, just, it doesn't matter if they're innocent or guilty, just kill them. Why, why are we having this discussion? It doesn't matter how, how, just, just kill them. Why don't we just kill them? Again and again and again and again and again, which to some people still appeals to them because they like, they like being authoritarian, they like being in charge. But the one thing you'll learn about the series is, is that every single person that called for the murder of innocent people during the course of the Soviet Union was killed while they were claiming to be innocent by the same people that murdered the innocent people ahead of them. That's the only cosmic justice in this whole sad and sordid tale is that the people who did the murdering without exception, except for Stalin, of course, who died under horrible circumstances as a result of his, his own paranoia, but every single one of the executioners were executed. Every single one of the people who were calling for the, for the imprisonment of false, falsely accused people were themselves imprisoned. And it's a system that devoured itself. I have a line in there that says communism is carnivorous. It eats meat and it's always hungry and it will chew up whatever is in front of it, including its own children. And and we see this not just in Russia, but we see it in in communist revolutions all around the world. We see it in China on a constant basis. So that we see it in policy. I mean, we see it in Berkeley. Yeah. Yeah, we saw it in Berkeley. Yes. You know, two movies come to mind. I don't know, it's, this is sort of a tangent, but I think it illustrates your point and my point. You, you, our point about the media. I watched the movie uh, Frida, about Frida Kahlo. Yeah. You know, and um, uh, Salma Hayek does a brilliant job of portraying this, but the whole thing is sort of like this pay into, you know, communist ideology, right? Yeah. Rivera and, you know, he's the, uh, and part of this is they're hiding Trotsky, right? Right. Well, I don't know if hiding is the right word. They're sheltering. That's correct. Yes. Right. And this is right before he gets killed. And, you know, Jeffrey Rush, who's a great actor again, does, you know, plays Trotsky as sort of like this, you know, uh, intellectual, the, the, you know, the, the dreamer uh, of, of, of the, of the communist ideal. And Trotsky, again, was just as bad as, as the rest of them. He was just as murderous. He was just as evil as the rest of them. And this movie tries to sell us on that, right? Yeah. Trotsky, okay. Trotsky's uh, taste, uh, you know, Trotsky didn't sit around and enjoy uh, feeding chickens and, and, and smelling the magnolias in a garden in, in Mexico City. Trotsky's taste ran to black leather and the smell of gun oil and blood. Trotsky invented the Red Army. Trotsky invented the blocking unit. For those of you unfamiliar with that term, when the Red Army was fighting the Civil War against the whites, they would send their soldiers forward and they would keep a couple of machine gun units in the back of their soldiers so that if the soldiers decided to turn and run, they would get gunned down by their own Red Army commissars. Right. Trotsky was the guy who invented the idea of this dual command where you've got military commanders making military decisions and equal to him is a political commissar who has the right to over over rule any particular military decision if the political commissar feels it's not in the best interest of party ideology. Trotsky is responsible for the murders of, of millions of people by direct order with his signature. There's nothing nice about this guy. He's not a kindly old man. He's just an old man. And he's and he's a guy who who among many other things, since you mentioned Frido Kahlo specifically, this is all you really need to know about communist um, uh, morality. 
here's a man who's running, can't find any place to find asylum in the world. He spends some time in Italy. Finally, the government of Mexico is persuaded to take Trotsky in as a, as a fugitive directly because of Diego, because, he, because of his prestige. And right. the first thing Trotsky does when he gets there is sleeps with this guy's wife. You know, I mean, this is, this yeah. is the kind of, this is the kind of person we're talking about here. And to romanticize this is to, is to ignore the, there's an episode coming up where I talk about the, the Baltic White Sea Canal, which was the first of these big Soviet super projects that Stalin later put into place. Right. He gave it to Gingrich Gota, who was one of his secret chief, police chiefs. And it was about 140 miles long and something like no, no less than 25,000 and probably closer to 100,000 people were killed working on this project. Towards the end of this project, Ed, they didn't have enough wood to shore up the banks of this canal. So the only thing they had that in, in abundance was human femurs. So that's what they used to hold the concrete in place. Now, on top of the, of the cruelty of this, you come back to the incompetence. You've got this mega project that killed hundreds of thousands of people. And when it was finished, they couldn't use it because it wasn't deep enough. They couldn't use it. Solzhenitsyn himself sat on the banks of the Baltic White Sea Canal in 1966. He said he, re- he said he saw two barges filled with firewood going one way and an empty barge going the other way over the course of 12 hours. That's what they murdered these people for. Yeah. This is Soviet Union in a nutshell. Prestige project, theory over practice, no, no solution other than to throw bodies at the problem. And this is the system that's being taught to American kids on American campuses as something that's um, far more kind and considerate than this horrible American uh, nightmare that we find ourselves in, according to them. Amen. And by the way, the second movie I was thinking of was The Death of Stalin, which I, I was, appreciated. I loved. I loved. I thought I loved. it was great. So I sat uh, with some friends and they all hated it. And I said, you guys don't understand. This is really good. <laughs> and it's really unusual because ho- I'm surprised Hollywood even made it with like real Hollywood stars and real Hollywood production values. Because it really did, in its humor, sort of, you know, you know, dark humor, uh, humorous way, it really did sort of portray Tell the truth. Yeah, about uh, about the nature of that regime. That was the it, nature of that regime. Michael Palin it, was brilliant in doing that. It, Michael Palin was brilliant, and, and Paul Whitehouse, who I think is the, the, the funniest man who ever lived, has also got a, a part in that. But the, but the thing about um, Death of Stalin, for those of you who've seen it, the part about it that is the most genuinely accurate is the is the i don't know maybe eight minute sequence about the death of beria because beria beria was the chief of 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 the soviet state monsters who who was known to just have his henchmen cruise the streets and pull 12 year old girls off the streets for 25 or 30 years rape them hand them a bouquet of flowers afterwards saying you know it was consensual and so and so beria murdered millions of people. And when it came time for them to come after Beria, Beria got down on his knees, begged and cried, promised that he would do anything. He'd go live in Siberia. He'd, you know, all all of these promises shot in the head, just like the rest of them. So um, it's all a very sad and accurate tale of duplicity, murder, incompetence, rage, theory, arrogance, and hubris. But again, my, my, single great objective in this, and I felt it more strongly with every month that I worked on, and I worked on it for seven months. I have an obligation to these people who've been murdered, who nobody knows about. Everybody knows about Auschwitz. Nobody knows about Kolyma. Kolyma is probably second on the leaderboard from hell after Auschwitz and just ahead of Treblinka. Probably eight or 900,000 people were murdered in, in a gulag called Kolyma. Uh, they weren't gas, they were just worked to death. Temperatures were 60 degrees below zero. You got about two months out of a man, two to three months. And these are musicians and doctors and theor- theoretical scientists out there mining gold and uranium 60 degrees below zero. That's how they killed people. They just got, they worked them to death. Yep. And, and so I felt so strongly two things. Number one, everything that I accuse them of has to be in their own words and it has to be verifiable. And secondly, I have to be absolutely every sentence that come out of my mouth. I've got to be able to source to be the truth because I got to have the receipts for this thing. The number of people that are in favor of the system and, and that will criticize something like this is, oh, it's just some guy just, you know, bl- blowing his opinion. It's not some guy blowing his opinion. This is them in their words. Yeah. And, you know, this is the thing is that you can make the connection here to Nazi Germany, which was 
just as industrial as much industrialized horror just over a shorter period of time mm -hmm. and then the soviet union or or china now right they always document this stuff and the reason why is because they're the bureaucrats of this are also living in a sort of a terror they have to show oh my god yes so it's always documented there's Here. always documentation for this type of stuff because that's the only way you survive is to show hey i'm doing my part exactly there's some just a couple things to unpack there first of all um the largest photo archive in the world we believe belongs to the kgb which well which, the fsb which used to be the kgb which used to be the ogpu which used to be the gru which used to be the nkvd which used to be the cheka but the secret police society that's gone through the history of the soviet union they have nine million photographs in their collection nine million mugshots of innocent people that had to be matched to their photographs because before they could be shot in the back of the head that's just that's just there but the but the really most important thing that you've said here is is the reason why we have this almost a a, a racial disgust at at the swastika it's it's, it's a, when i say racial i mean a human race we we, yes. we it, it's burned into our collective unconsciousness this is a stain on who we are and we don't have that for the for the hammer and sickle and i think the reason is because we don't have pictures yet you know, we have photographs of, of the concentration camps. We have photographs of, of the gas chambers. We have photographs of the mounds of dead bodies being pushed into the into the ground with bulldozers. We have photographs of SS soldiers. We don't. We had trials after the war of, of of the Nuremberg trials. We don't have any of that for the Soviets. We don't have any of that for the Chinese either. By the way, who managed to triple the Soviet score, um, and and that lack of of physical pictures, that picture it didn't happen kind of aspect to it is is why this particular case is so hard to prove you don't have the photographic evidence so the closest thing you can have to photographic evidence or video evidence or surveillance evidence is what do the people who are accused of these crimes say in their own words about what they're doing and when you can when you can convict them on their own testimony then you then you've got a conviction um the the comparison with the nazis is just so obvious and 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 it was one of the people I, I read quite a bit of when i was researching this is a guy named martin amos who's the son of kingsley amos he's a very clever writer and he was he was talking about this and he said that he thinks one of the reasons why the the, the communists don't have quite the same um visceral kind of revulsion that the nazis produced was because of this kind of level of incompetence that there's something comical about about the soviet system remember that wendy's commercial that came out at the end of the cold war where all of these fat russian women are coming out in various versions of the uniform and about, very nice very nice yeah there's, some, there's something comical the number one source of, of deaths in moscow for something like 10 years after the um world war ii ended in the 50s and 60s number one source of, of death in moscow was fires caused by exploding televisions I mean, th th this is th this is not the kind of thing that that you should even be considering seriously. P.G. O'Rourke went to um, P.G. O'Rourke's guy, maybe a conservative, and P.G. O'Rourke went to Moscow in the in the eighties or nineties, and he went into this room. And he said it looked like this room had been built by apes. That the that the corners, that the walls and the ceiling didn't join, and and the, and that the tables were were weren't true and just the whole world is almost like shockingly incompetent and it's incompetent because people are working out of fear rather than working out of either love or duty or desire or or, or, or loyalty expect. or whatever yeah just financial incentive right yep huh. yep the worst people in the in the country rise in a system that's predicated on that and when people say if oh if only trotsky had taken over instead of instead of stalin there's a very simple reason why trotsky didn't take over instead of Stalin, and that's because he wasn't as ruthless as Stalin was. And that system is predicated on ruthlessness. You can't have it both ways. You cannot have a guy who's less ruthless taking over a system that's built on ruthlessness. Your entire argument is like the difference between the, uh, the, um, the immovable object versus the irresistible force. Well, which one would win? Well, if there's an immovable, immovable object, there is no irresistible force. If there's an irresistible force, there can be no immovable object. So they're trying to argue it both ways, but they can't. They can't. And again, Hayek said, Hayek said that, I, I want to say 1940, 1941, 1939. And it's very true. That's that's exactly why you get Stalins and Trotskys, or, or why a Stalin would went out over a Trotsky. It, that system rewards ruthlessness. And the more ruthless you are, the more you're going to rise. But it has nothing to do with competence. And that's, that's right. And that's... 
Yeah, and that's the reason. It's like it's the op- it's the opposite of competence. Right. Because if you have a ruthless person like Stalin, Stalin insisted. Toward, this is after the war when he was in steep mental decline. But Stalin insisted on on being constantly called the greatest scientist of all time, the greatest theoretician of all time. It was it, it, just all of this. And so what happens is if you've got a competent person in a system that's run by somebody like a Stalin or a Lenin, they're not an asset. They're a threat. Competence is exterminated. And, and so is initiative. And so are all the other qualities that make life good here in America. Initiative, uh, 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 exceptionalism, uh, hard work, um, extraordinary quality or talent of any kind. All of this is just simply eliminated as a potential threat. The only people that survived Stalin were the ones who were his cook. Who's right. by, by the way, I don't know if you knew this. Um, I don't remember if this is in episode one. Um, do you know about the story of Stalin's cook? No, I don't know that. I don't well, know this, that. This, this might have a quick little effect on you. I'll give it to you very fast. When Lenin finally got his own little, it's bigger than a dacha, but smaller than a mansion. He had a little house and he had a staff of four. He had a, a secretary, he had uh, his, his wife, his sister was there. He had a cook and four security guards. And the cook outlasted Lenin. When Lenin died, Stalin hired the same guy, Comrade Spiridon, his first name was Spiridon, hired Spiridon. So Spiridon was the only person in the entire history of the Soviet Union that lived with Lenin and then went on and lived with Stalin and served every one of these people dinner who would later go on and be executed. Well, it turns out that, that Comrade Spiridon, the cook, uh, his last name was uh, Spiridon Putin, turned out to be Vladimir Putin's grandfather, his grandfather. So think about this for a minute. Spiridon dies when Vladimir Putin is 16 years old. So Vladimir Putin hears the story of the Soviet Union from the only individual in the face of the planet that actually lived with the great Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, who actually lived with the great Joseph Ivanovich Stalin. He's the only person in the entire planet who was on the inside of both of those systems. And this is the voice that influenced Vladimir Putin as a child. And we look at what's happening now and we wonder, wow, we can't possibly understand his motivations. He simply killed this guy in prison. Of course he killed this guy in prison. That's what they do. That's that's Stalin said, no man, no problem. So you got a problem with the dissident and he could be a threat to you in the next so-called election. No man, no problem. People are going to wail and moan. What are they going to do? Nothing. They're going to write strongly written letters. We don't care about that. Well, Bill, this is, I, I mean, we're going to have to wrap this up at this point, but people really need to go over Daily, Daily Wire Plus um, and take a look at this uh, at, at this uh, documentary series that you've got here. The documentary series is What We Saw in Empire of Terror. The th- yet three episodes available now for people who subscribe. As we write, the, as we record this, and then there's once a week for a total of eight episodes. Total of eight episodes. And this is not the first series you've done for Daily Wire Plus either, right? No, I did uh, Apollo 11, what we saw. I did the Cold War, what we saw. I did a series called America's Forgotten Heroes, and um, and this is the fourth one. And uh, this one is, uh, I, I hate to keep coming back to it, I'll just close with it. This one I, I did not look at as a history, as a historian. This one I looked at as a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer, I, you know. Right, no, but I guess, against, I guess. Uh, this was This was an obligation that I felt. And I don't know whether I succeeded or not, but I do know I gave it my very best shot. Well, again, Daily Wire Plus, if you want to see this series, and I assume the other series are still available on Daily Wire Plus. They are, in fact, yes. The entire series is, is all of them are there. Apollo 11 is a great deal of fun. I'm, you know, I grew up, I, my father worked in the space program. He worked on Gemini, uh, Apollo, and the space shuttle. So I it, gotta- it's actually, Apollo 11 is actually about the space race. We did it on the on the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, but it starts with a with a Chinese bottle rocket and, and, and goes all the way up to um, to SpaceX. So you, you should take it, take a look at it. It's, and that one is a tremendous amount of fun. You you have sold me again, Bill Whittle. Hooray. <laughs> I, I I can't tell you what a joy it was to sit down and talk with you again. It's been and way to see you long. again way too long. Oh my goodness, my friend, be well. And, Thank you. Uh, we will, and we will uh, come back and do this again, hopefully in a shorter period of time. Bill Whittle, Daily Wire Plus, what we saw, an Empire of Terror. Be sure to check that out. <laughs>